Welcome to step 27 Capricorn. We will be transitioning into 28 degrees soon, which is the manifestation step. Let me know how you're all doing in the comments, where you're from, and also let me know if you're doing the 28 day life reset. What are you experiencing right now? Give everybody a moment to get in. Energy strong right now. We've been doing our morning maneuvers and I noticed the, the waves the last three days have been more intense. And I find whenever the waves are more intense, usually there's more going on with people emotionally. India, Hawaii. Yeah, so if you're actually in our app right now, we added a location section. So you can join based on your location. If you are in New York, you can sign up for the New York group so you can connect with people doing fashion maneuvers in your area. We weren't able to put every area on there um, for obvious reasons. I mean, there's hundreds of states, cities, countries, but what we did is we took the ones that were the most popular and we created spaces for you. So um, you can find that in the Circle community or in our app. Go in there and you can find people in your area. And I suggest um, there, there will be some that have a country and then a region. So uh, Canada, for example, we have Canada. And then we also have, I think, three of the provinces that had a lot of people in it. So if you don't have a specific area, at least you can lean on the country. And as we grow, we'll be able to scale that. We'll be able to create more spaces. But the idea, the theme for me this year has really been about how to bring people together now, how to bring together the community from around the world. Um, we've been doing it online for a long time. There's lots of ways to do it online, but I wanna find other ways to help people connect. And it is not easy. Technology makes life easier, but there's still a lot of things that we're working out to try and make it possible. How many calories will take you out of autophagy during a fast? Uh, you're going for two weeks. Stick to water. Um, water and minerals is really all you need. Um, we fasted for 44 days. I mean, that had a dr drastic shift in my body because I didn't have a lot of weight on me to start. I'd say you lose about a pound a day or half a pound to a pound a day, depending where your, what your starting point is. And within three days, your body goes into uh, stem cell production. So you'll start healing and growing. A lot of cracking. Yeah, cracking is pressure bubbles in the body. Um, your bones don't, like even if you smack, okay, if you put two bones in a fish tank, and you smack them as hard as you possibly could together, would it make that kind of sound? No, probably not. So how is that possible that your bones are making a cracking sound like that inside of a fish tank, which is your body, which has a gel-like substance or water-like substance called fascia. Your bones, they don't crack like that. It's the pressure bubbles within the fascia. That's my belief, um, it's kind of a hard one to validate. And I mean, people have been just putting theories around what cracking is. Um, I believe it's a pressure, it's a pressure bubble and you're moving pressure around. And if you have a restriction in an area and pressure can't move, it builds tension and eventually it builds pain and toxins and there's no more flow there. So. If you're moving around doing the fashion maneuvers or doing any sort of body work, you're going to feel pressure distribute. You're going to feel it move around. So that's probably what you're experiencing. That's a good sign. Eventually it'll just be like an open flowing system. That's ideally what you want. Yeah. If you don't want to lose too much, I mean, I don't particularly know anybody who is a breatharian who completely lives off of air. I've heard that it's possible. 
Um, I'm not sure at what state of awareness you need to be to be able to do something like that. I went from 210 pounds of muscle as a professional athlete working out every day to about 180, 175 through clearing my environment and by stopping working out. So I stopped trying to build my body up to this machine. I stopped flooding my system with chemicals. I started managing my emotions. I cleaned out my environment and I stopped overeating, trying to stuff protein and other things into my body. And by doing that, I went from 210 pounds to about 180 in I would say about a year. Keep in mind, I drop weight much faster than most. So we did the fast, I was about 175, 180, and at the end of 44 days, I was about 140 pounds, 145 pounds. So I would say it's about a pound a day, a little bit less than that. Um, since then, I have put back on about 10 or 15 pounds. I would say I'm about 150, 155. And I sit there naturally now. Do I want to build muscle on top of my body again? No. Um, do I overeat? No. I never eat till the point that I'm full anymore. I used to do that all the time. I wouldn't stop eating until I had stuffed so much food or medicine or drug into my body. And uh, yeah, that was, I used to overeat. Fasting changed my relationship with food. I no longer overeat. I eat to the point where I feel satiated, which is about 70% full. I've probably experienced that overeating feeling about twice in the last year which is something I used to experience every day. I used to have food comas and be knocked out by how much I would eat, but no longer have that, no longer overeat. Um, I only eat when my body asks, and I only eat what my body asks for. I do not use my brain to tell me that I need a nutrient. I do not use uh, science books or program schedules to tell me when to eat and what to eat. I don't believe in doing that. I don't believe in dieting. I don't believe in eating what you're supposed to eat just because you're supposed to eat it. I think everybody's body's different. I think everybody needs something different. And I think that your body knows and that you have an intuition of what's right for you. And it's about understanding what your body's asking you to do. That is a more uh, sustainable approach, in my opinion, to food. I don't think saying I'm gonna eat this much every single day at this time and I'm gonna make sure I stuff it in and, and I get it in and it just doesn't work that way. There's a reason why people don't do that consistently. I don't believe in behavior changes that are unsustainable. I believe in creating behaviors and habits that are sustainable. It's okay to have an experience, like I'm gonna fast for three days and not eat anything because I'm doing that for an experience to learn something or have a, a rapid shift or transformation through that. I'm not doing that because that's my lifestyle. Um, so dieting, if you're doing, it depends on the intention, it depends what you're learning from it, it depends what you're trying to get out of it. And if it's for a short period of time and you're studying your body when you're testing something, then I think that that's okay. But to, to limit yourself or to force yourself to do something that doesn't feel right for a period of time and then it's so unsustainable that you end up giving up anyways it's like like i look at working out people who lift weights i would say about 95 percent of people who lift weights up and down for about an hour to two hours a day most of them don't actually enjoy the activity there is a percentage of people who enjoy lifting weights let's take them out of the equation or the conversation right now Let's take the other 90%, 95% of people who actually don't enjoy lifting weights, but they're doing it for another reason. At some point, after working out for a year and a half straight, for two hours a day, that you get sick, or that you get tired of doing it, or you get tired of waking up because you don't enjoy it, you don't have that internal motivation anymore, and you stop. 
and you stop for like two weeks and all of your progress is almost gone entirely. And now you have to start fresh again. That is a super unsustainable task. I don't see that as a productive use of your time. If it's something you enjoy, that's different. But how many of you have invested over 300 hours working out, running in a gym, on a treadmill, lifting weights that no longer do it? How much time did you put into that? And what was the end result of it? If you didn't enjoy it and you're not doing it anymore, then was that time wasted? Did you have an experience? Did you enjoy it at the time? Did you make friends? I mean, there's, there's, there's other ways you can go with it, but what I'm talking about right now is a sustainable lifestyle. Something, if you wanna be healthy, you have to do things that you enjoy, that feels right for you, that you can consistently do for long enough to get the result. Otherwise, it's, it's really a waste. Now, if you're doing something short period of time because it's, it's so rapid, it's out of your comfort zone, and it's gonna give you an experience or teach you something that's different. Like we did psilocybin every day for a year. Um, you know, I've done different things that are unsustainable, but I did them because my intention was to learn something or to have an experience. But my intention was not to make that my, my new normal. That was you for 45 years, yep. <laughs> I look at how much time it's like I liked running after a soccer ball I didn't like running so they're very different I enjoy playing the sport and you know what I've seen a lot of athletes the injury rate in athletes is rapidly rising but our ability to help them is also getting better and why is it getting why are, why are they getting more injured? It just doesn't make sense to me. And you look at the best of the best of the best athletes, what do they do in their routines? And how often do they get injured versus the ones who aren't as good and get injured a lot? One of the things is their routines. Lifting a weight up and down does not necessarily correlate to better performance. If you bench press 400 pounds, does that mean that you can tackle someone in football better? Maybe. Why don't you just tackle a bunch of people and get really good at tackling people? You can do it or you can do something else that has some benefit towards it. And if you listen to some of the top athletes they're the, uh, and, and their routines, a lot of them don't actually lift that much weights. A lot of them just practice more than everybody else. If you practice the behavior that you enjoy and you practice the behavior that you want to get better at, you'll get better at that. Now, if you do a behavior that you don't enjoy and it's, it will help you with that, but it's not the behavior, it's not going to make sense. So lifting a weight up and down is not the same as dunking a basketball or kicking a soccer ball. Kick, it, kick a soccer ball a thousand times. Don't lift a weight so you get strong enough to kick a soccer ball. Just kick it. Kick it, kick it, kick it, kick it. That's my belief system around it. Um, I see the injuries going up. People are working out more. They're getting tighter and they're creating more restrictions. And I, I always wondered this, but I was an athlete and I played soccer and I had the ability to use my body very differently. And I had friends in high school who lifted weights and they could lift more weights than me. And it was, in, it was in one direction, like a bench press or like a curl or whatever. And then we would mess around when we'd go to a cabin and it'd be like, who could throw each other off the, you know, let's throw each other off of the, uh, off the dock. Last one standing wins, right? And I would somehow manage to throw them all off. And they were all bigger than me. They were all stronger than me. They were all taller, heavier. They all lifted weights, they all worked out a lot. I didn't do any of that, I was just an athlete. And here I am throwing bigger, stronger guys off of the dock into the water and I'm the last man standing. None of them could take me out. And, uh, and I thought that that was interesting because you would think the person that was lifting weights would be able to use their body in an activity that re relies on strength, but it doesn't work that way, it doesn't translate. I, was, I had to use my body 
where I would push people away and run and move at the same time. So I had to use my entire body or my entire system to produce a movement and I got really good at that. Versus this. When do you ever do this in your life? And you will, any repetitive action, like even even like kicking a soccer ball more on your right leg than the left, you're gonna create an imbalance. And I've had this thought process for myself for a long time, which is, do I wanna go back to a sport that I love irrespective of the imbalances and injuries that come with it? And It's a tough one because I love playing soccer. I love playing sports. I want to play sports. And then when I play, I feel the damage that it's doing to my body. So do I sacrifice my my vessel, my body for something that I love? Or do I find other activities that I can do that support my body at the same time? It's it's a tough one. And I, I haven't really come to a conclusion, but I'm, I haven't taken an action on playing a sport again in a long time because I know the implications on my body and I don't know if I want to do that. I love my body too much and I've been working so hard to put my body in in the state that it's in now that to go in and do that would be ca- counterintuitive. And then I go to the second layer of it which is but is that just my perception? Can I play now and not get injured because my body's at a better position? And what about happiness? Is happiness a better indicator of long-term success for me than, than feeling good in my body? It's all about priority. I've looked at several people over the last few years and also listened to some, what have, what Gary shared from the garage and he would pull lab tests from people who are overweight that, you would assume had all of their numbers in the red, but they were in the green. And that was interesting. So he went and and tested them again and checked the lab equipment to make sure everything was good. And what he found out was they were happy and other people weren't. So this person was genuinely happy. And, And at first he wasn't sure if they really were happy, but after really getting to know them over a 12 week period, saw that they're genuinely a happy person. And that's the only thing that he could think of that could describe why this person's lab test was different than others. And then I watched one of our, um, one of our staff members here in Mexico. He's uh, he helps clean and you know, he's in his seventies and he's the sweetest, happiest, nicest person. And, you know, if you're, if you're his age, doing what, doing what you love, smiling, singing, laughing, having a good time in life, that's a pretty good measurement. I mean, like, is that not something that you want when you're older, when you're over your seventies? And I thought, you know what, that's super interesting. And so I look at his health and I look at his body and I, without judgment, I'm looking and saying, does this happiness that he brings with him correlate to where he is in his health? And the answer to that was not entirely. I don't think it can be distilled down to one thing. He has had some health issues recently and that made me really think about it because I hear, okay, you know, lab tests can change from being happy. And then I see someone that's super happy going through health issues. So correlation doesn't mean causation or just because they have one thing doesn't mean like, what about all the other things that they're doing in their day to day life? And I think, I think the best way to approach it is just how we approach the human body. It's like, instead of trying to distill it down to that one supplement, distill it down to that one emotion distill it down to that one activity it's to look at it from a holistic perspective can i get to 80 percent of alignment or 95 percent of alignment in 
several areas. So is my day-to-day -day routines where I want them to be? Do I, do I have a self-care routine? Do I have an emotional management or awareness routine? Do I nurture the relationships that I've built? Do I take time with my family? Do I spend time in nature? Do I, am I conscious when I eat and what I put in my body? I think it's looking at it from a holistic perspective. And if you can do enough of those things collectively, it will overwhelm the negatives. It's a game of pluses and minuses. And you can be the happiest person in the world, but you can abuse your body for 20 years and you're gonna feel pain. Because the happiness might put you in like a 10 positive, but the abuse that you're doing to your body might put you in a minus five or in the, the, the minus five negative. And so net, at the end of all of your activities, it comes down to a single measurement, which is are you in the plus or are you in the minus? Are you growing or are you dying? Are you healing or are you, or are you breaking down? Are you transforming or are you, break, are you um, not, not transforming, I guess is the best way to put it. So I don't think it's so simple and I think everybody, I think that there is an, it's important that we have specialties and it's important that we focus on the, the details. The devil is in the details, but I also think it's important to bring that into a holistic perspective at the same time. How do we do that? It's to say, okay, well, what are all the areas of life? You've got your family, you've got your intimate relationship, you've got your sexuality, you've got your profession, your work or your career, you've got your rest and rejuvenation, you've got your health and your wellness, you've got your spirituality, you've got your I think that's it. If I'm missing one, please put in the comments. But you've got each of these areas. And the objective is to satiate enough of each of those areas so that the net number at the end of the day is positive. And this goes to another thing that I think about, which is even if you do all of those things right, yes, social life, it's friends. So friends, family, intimate relationship. Thank you. So even if you do all the things right, hypothetically speaking, does that necessarily mean that you can't have something come up in your body or that you can't have an injury? I don't know. I'm, I'm not really sure. I think that... I think that it's possible but the universe shows different. The universe goes up and down. Everything in the universe has an up and a down. So to only experience up is not, it, it goes against the laws of the universe. So you have to have a down. And what I see happen in society, I do this myself, is we all want up. And we go up, 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 and it's like, please stay here. But the things that you're doing no longer take you higher. So you want more. So you take more coffee and you work out harder and you work out longer and you have more sex, whatever it might be, right? And so you're trying to go up, 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 up and you, you hit this peak. And that peak is based on your potential. And we try and stay there. And because we try and stay there, we hang on and hang on and hang on, but naturally there's, an, there's a natural rhythm that has to come down. And so we avoid that down or we pretend that we're not down or we suppress the experience when we come down. And that down is important because that, if I'm up here all the time, I forget that I'm here. When I go to the beach every day for three months straight, I no longer have the excitement when I wake up to go to the beach. I'm human being, I'm a human being, okay? As grateful as I am, as appreciative as I am, I don't wake up with that same excitement than if I haven't gone to the beach in, in a month and now all of a sudden I wanna build a routine around it again. So that up, 
you for you, the 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 appreciation, the gratitude, it, it it gets lost, and the body makes that up feel normal. Like if your blood pressure rises and your body can't move it around, it makes that your new your new normal or your new your new neutral point. If you're happy all the time, that becomes your new normal. So you don't know that you're happy. So you're sitting up there, and the the circumstances are going to come to you to help you experience that down. And as you come down, what we do is we take a medication or we try and do a maneuver or we try and avoid the pain or we try and forget that it's not there or suppress it or ignore it or whatever. And we don't actually experience the down. Now, because you suppress the down, you can't go as high because you don't go as far down, you can't come back up. Think of it like if I can go this high and I go this low, this is my boundary. But if I don't let myself go that low and I go here, this is your new boundary. So the extremes are less. And yeah, it's, it's a funny one. I mean, this is just something that I think about. So what if we allow ourselves to acknowledge and appreciate and sit with the down for a moment? Instead of avoiding it for 10 years until it's so big that it smacks you on the head, takes you out for months or years, actually acknowledge and experience it. See what happens and see what you can learn from it because there is something that comes from that experience. When you're in pain, emotionally, physically, mentally, or something happens in your, in your, in your life that takes you down, there is something there. And while you're there, just know that by natural law, you have to come back up. So you can create the contrast in your experience or the contrast can come to you. You get to choose. And Sometimes it's going to come to you and you don't get a choice. And well, you don't get a choice in that moment. You made the choice for that moment. But these are just things that I think about. I don't have answers to them. Um, but I think that it's important to at least bring up the question in the conversation because if we avoid pain for a long time, I feel that's when it hits people on the top of the head so hard that they can't come out of it. How do you create contrast? I think it's important to create contrast by stepping away from the experience for a moment. There's, I, I do believe in consistency. I think consistency over time is, is what creates success, no matter what it is, okay? But when are you measuring the consistency? If somebody goes to the gym every single day and they take one day off, but they go to the gym every single day after that for the next three years, were they consistent? Yes. They just took one day off, but that one day gave them the contrast. So what we do and what I do, and I do it strategically and based off of my feelings is, I'll go to the beach every day for a month. Sure, I'll, com I'll commit to that. But when that 30, 31st, 32nd day hits and the month's over, I'm gonna stop. And I'm gonna stop for a couple days or a week and then I'll come back to it. But depending on what it is, how long you stop for has an impact on the end result. Like if you're working out and you stop for two weeks, you're gonna lose the results that you had. But if you stop for a couple days, rest, rejuvenate, get contrast, you'll come back to it completely fresh and you'll probably actually lift more and you'll probably see the exercises differently and you'll experience them differently. So there is a pivotal point where if you have contrast for too long, you have to find a way to get back into that frequency. And the way that I see frequency is like a radio station. So you're tuning into different channels on your radio. You know, you can go to 103.5 or 102.9 or, you know, you're picking a channel and at that channel, there's thoughts, there's conversations, there's emotions, there's people, there's ideas, there's experiences, there's 
all these things that come with tuning into that frequency. The more you tune into it, the more you experience it, the more you do it, the more information you're gonna gather from that frequency. And this is where somebody spends decades at a specific frequency. They know it from top to bottom. They, they understand it implicitly. Somebody who's a professional athlete understands the human body implicitly. They focus their time and attention towards that frequency for a long time. They tuned into that channel, that radio channel. They subscribed to it for a long time. There's actually a, an extra, a really cool video that I found a long time ago that my friend sent me the other day and I, I think I wanna bring it up. Let me see if I can bring it up. Okay. I mean, this is like, a lot of people have already seen this, but I think it's super cool. I think it's something to, that helps explain how we see the world and how our lens dictates our experience. And one of the ways I like to think about this is, let's say you're tuned into the frequency of cooking. You're a chef. Right? So if you're a chef, I want you to take glasses and I want you to put on those glasses. That's a chef. Now you might be a father as well. So take on another lens and clip it on. So now you've got chef, father, take on uh, tennis player. Okay, so chef, father and tennis player. And you see the world from that lens. That's the frequency or the radio stations that you subscribe to. Any information, people, friends, experiences are gonna come through those lenses. So everything you do, you see it from that lens. Now, if you're a chef and you walk into a restaurant, you're going to see everything that a chef would see. You're gonna smell the food, you're gonna see the presentation, you're gonna look at the waiters and their service, you're gonna look at how every, what plates they use, how the table's set up, how the staff works together. So you're gonna take all of that through your lens as a father as well, and as a tennis player, and you're going to have some sort of subjective truth around that experience. Now, if I'm a burglar or a, a thief or a cheat, and I have that lens on, and I walk into that same restaurant, I'm gonna see every way I can steal. Oh, that person left their cash tip on the table. I'm just gonna walk by and pick up that $20 bill before the waiter sees, right? so. The lenses that you have on is what you see. You can't see outside of those lenses. And you'll get this where you walk past something and you're like, for 10 years and you've never noticed something. Why did all of a sudden you notice it? Because you tuned into that. It's now important to you. You're now focusing on it. Like for example, let's say you go to the store with your friend to help them pick out a new couch. Well, when you walk in your house, all of a sudden you're gonna notice your couch. And you're gonna notice that you also need a new couch or that there's a scratch on it because you're now tuning into that. It's now you're telling your awareness or your subconscious that couches are important to you because you were just shopping for one with your friend. Even though it was for their house, you've tuned into it. Now you notice a scratch or a scuff or a stain on your own. But it was there for a long time. You ask your roommate, the roommate goes, yeah, yeah, that happened like years ago. Don't you remember? And it's like, no, I never saw that. How is that possible? You live there. It's there every day, but you just noticed it. And that's because your subconscious or the lens that you put on is dictating what you see. And this video is just one example of that. And I'm going to show you right now. And I know a lot of you have seen this already, but we're going to pull it up. Maybe I'll do like a reel about it or something. Okay, how do we, uh, let's flip this. Okay, so let me zoom in. So, oh, you guys can't read it. It's backwards. Can you read that? Those words? Put, me, put in the comments if you can read what that says right there. might be backwards no ah okay huh can I f I can't unmirror this <laughs> you can read backwards yes it's backwards okay 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 hold on let me try another way 
Let me try this way. Can you read that now? Okay, so you can read it. Does that, is that still backwards? You gotta let me know in the comments. <laughs> That's better? Okay. Okay, so I know this has been on social media for a while now, and a lot of people have already seen it, but this is just an example of what I'm talking about. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna read one and you're gonna listen. Can I zoom in? Oh yes, okay. So let's turn the volume on. Okay, let me know in the comments if you could hear that and if you saw what happened. If you didn't, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't experienced it, or you couldn't hear it, let me know too. There's another, uh, actually, I'm gonna see if I can find another example while, while we're talking here. And it's a, it's a guy, he did a presentation on a TED Talk. And yes, you can hear it, okay, good. So what happened? Can someone explain to me what just happened? Uh, what was the other one? TED Talk. Come on, someone's gotta know this name. What it was the TED Talk? Does anybody know? Um, TED Talk, you read what you, you hear what you read. Let's see if I can find it. Why reading matters, no, the power of importance, how to speak to. Okay, I don't, I don't know the name of this TED Talk. Does somebody know? The truest example of creating your own reality, is that what it's called? Okay, the truest example of creating <laughs> that was probably not what it's called that's probably just a comment okay what reality are you creating for yourself I might have found it hang on so let me just quickly scan through this and what was interesting is what you read is what you get or so yeah what you read is what you get so irrespective of what you heard no, this doesn't look like it. No, okay, it's not gonna work. So you're reading Green Needle. Our research shows that you're, you're reading Green Needle and you hear Green Needle and then you read Brainstorm and then you hear Brainstorm. So, that, it's a trippy one, but what does that make you think about your life? Like, have you ever had that situation where you're at a table and there's six people having a conversation and you all walk away with a different story of what happened. Everybody feels different, everybody has a different story. There's that elephant example, you know, six hands on an elephant and they're all blind men and they're all describing their experience differently and they're arguing of what they're touching. I'm touching a, a pole, no, I'm touching a tail, no, I'm touching a flag or whatever and they're all arguing and then a sighted man comes over and says, you guys are all touching an elephant. So you really do create your reality. And I, I think it's, I think where we get tripped up is, yeah, that's great in theory, but how do you actually turn that into your life? How do you, how do you make that a habit? And the way that I think you can do it is to set some sort of routine where your thoughts, your emotions, and your experiences are habituated. Because everything that you do, anytime you do a new behavior, you focus and you hyper-focus. But as you do it over and over and over and over again, your body can eventually do it better than you can. And the example I like to use is when you drive, 
when you're learning, you're like super focused, you're, you know, you're looking at everything, you're, you don't want to be talked to or anything. But then as you, as you progress and get better, eventually it gets to a point where you can drive, have a conversation, look at your phone, change the radio station, drink your coffee or whatever, and not know how you got home. Your body was able to habituate and automate that so that it could run the program with or without you being consciously present. So, you have thoughts every day and you have emotions every day that run automatically without you being consciously present. And those are constantly telling a story and a narrative behind the scenes. And it's constant. It's that, it's that voice that keeps talking, keeps talking, keeps saying things, keeps saying things. And it's like, can you change that voice? Yes. But it takes time. And if you do one exercise, it's not going to work. You have to create a habit of doing this. It's, it's catching yourself when your brain runs the automatic program. And it's changing that program to the one that you want. So notice the behavior, notice the, the narrative that you keep running. Maybe it's that you don't look good enough, or maybe that it's you wish you, I don't know, you wish you were smarter or whatever. And that constantly infects your current experience. Recognize that that's an automatic program that's running. And it could be running from when you were five or six years old. A comment was made when you were in class. And if you can consciously recognize that that pattern is running subconsciously and it's dictating your current experience because that's now projecting out, stop it, create a new mantra or a new program and, and say that over and over again until that becomes now your automatic pattern. So I do this all the time. In the, in the shower, I sing to myself, but I don't sing songs that other people have made because I don't like to listen to songs where there's lyrics and those lyrics talk about breakups and sadness and life falling apart and all this horrible stuff. That's programming me. I want to listen to something that's putting me into a positive state of awareness. It's putting me into a much better reality than I currently have. So I don't listen to music anymore. But I do sing to myself and I sing the silliest things, but I sing positive words or, or positive things that I want to come into my current experience so that that starts to run over and over and over and over again, irrespective of if I'm conscious or not. I'm teaching my body to run that automatic program. This is what AI is doing. AI is running automatic programs, but you still have to consciously build the program. You still have to go in, understand what you want, understand what it is, create a habit, build it, and once it's built, it will run with or without you for the next decade. And every once in a while, it'll have a glitch, it'll all break, and you gotta call the IT department to help you fix it. You can call Human Garage, and you can do your fast maneuvers and whatever, and you can fix it, right? So, you're, you're, you're reprogramming your body, and you can do it in many different ways, but focusing on creating your own mantras, mantra, whatever, however you want to call it. Saying I am, sure, that's one way of doing it. But there is a type of meditation practice that people do and it's not really my style because when I meditate, I like to float and create, but it's very controlled. It's a controlled meditation where they take statements and they repeat them over and over and over again in a very structured way and they're they're literally cr repeating statements over and over and telling a story in their head as if they're talking to someone but it's 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 rewiring their brain to run that and so that is one way to do it you can say things out loud you can name your plant after you and talk to it positively there's all these different ways of doing it but the goal at the end of the day how you get there doesn't matter but the goal is to find a way for your body to run a program with or without you being present. Most music today is hurting the body. Most songs have horrible programming language. Horrible. Movies too. Movies are programming. That whenever you laugh or cry 
or have a deep emotion when you watch something or when you listen to something, it it, it runs and executes a program. And the if you have an emotion tied to it, the deeper the program. That's a fast way. Like if you wanna fast track a program into your subconscious, tie it to an emotion, because that's like a delivery mechanism. But if you just say it over and over and over again and there's not that much meaning, you, it takes longer, it takes repetitions. Um, and the other thing that I've learned is that some people manifest better when they focus on what they don't want, whereas others manifest better when they focus on what they do want. So there is no right or wrong. There's what's subjectively true for you. I manifest better when I focus on what I want and I do not allow or do not participate in negative thinking, negative patterns, negative programming, defeating language, pessimism that is not in my nature innately. I do not create best when I do that. Some people do. And I had to learn that the hard way because I would have people around me who would say negative things or use don't wants as their way to manifest. And then it would, it would, it would piss me off because I'm like, stop talking to yourself like that or stop saying things like that. But what they're doing is they're actually manifesting for themselves in a positive way. They're just using what they don't want as a mechanism to get there. There's so many different ways to get to the end result. What I've learned is, is it's not some people, they have to focus on the process in order to get there. Other people, they focus on the end result and that's it. There's a million different ways to get to the, goal, to get to the end result. How we get there is your choice. Some people will do it through negative thinking. Some people will do it through positive thinking. Some people will do it through a mix of both. There is no right or wrong and I don't want you to go running around getting mad at people for saying negative things or listening to negative music because maybe that's actually their way that they manifest. That's their journey. I learned that. I, I actually did a, a really cool session with a, uh, a close friend of Aisha's and she brings in usable information from your soul imprint. So your Akashic records. And a lot of people believe in this, a lot of people don't. That's okay. Where I'm gonna go with it is most Akashic Records readers or people who perceive and read information that you can't see tend to provide information that is not grounded or usable. Like telling me that 20 lifetimes ago I was a priest or 20 lifetimes ago I was the, a politician. How, like what does that matter? It doesn't influence me. In the, well. I'm not even sure how that influences me in my current experience. So it's not really usable information. In this case, the reading or, or the profile that was created for me was really specifically about how I manifest and what my, my energy is at the core. And what it taught me was there is no one size fits all solution. There is no right or wrong way to do things, in my experience. In some people's experience, they actually have to do right versus wrong. In my experience, it's not that way. And so she ran my, my, manif my manifestation blueprint. And this is actually a really cool profile. Let me just pull it up. And there's seven questions. And you can write these down. You can see if you can intuit or feel out which ones resonate with you because everybody manifests differently and there is a series of questions that you can use in order to determine the way that you manifest best so let's pull this up okay so here's my profile manifested manifestation blueprints here we go so 
It's important to understand that basic principles of manifestation are universal. They work the same for everyone. Ultimately, all you need to do to create any result or circumstance in your life is to change your energetic state or vibration into alignment with that goal. And of course, take aligned new actions to shift reality in the direction you're choosing. Okay, great. So there's a universal law of how to manifest. Tune into the frequency, align your, your actions to that frequency, and eventually you'll get there. I agree. Therefore, standard manifestation practices and plans will always work without this profile. However, the way in which we most effectively and efficiently change our states is different. There are specific different differences in how we really can get our creation efforts supercharged. So consider the below profile as a more fine tuned pathway to achieve manifestation results that is best suited to you. So yes, we have a universal law of how you manifest and then we've got specifics of like, how do you manifest best for you the most efficient way? And there's a series of questions. So question number one, is do you experience yourself more in likeness or unlikeness when you are the same or different to the people and circumstances around you? Now, this one's interesting. So what it's saying is when you are creating your reality, are you able to change your energetic vibration to manifest your life? the best when you have circumstances and people around you that are the same or that are different. Mine is the same. So I'm designed to, through, uh, to have experiences through likeness. So people in situations that are like me. People in circumstances that resonate as similar to yours allows you to tune into your own gifts a lot more. You will notice what makes you like others and the gifts that you see in others are the ones that are in you. You are designed to focus on the similarities between yourself and others, not the differences. You will manifest most effectively when you, sur when you are surrounded by like people and it's best for you to create in an environment that is like your divine nature. You will thrive abundantly when serving people like you and do best with clients, bosses, role models that represent that similarity. You'll do very well to have a person, group, or environment that serves as an anchor to the vibrational state that you are moving towards. Hang out in the new vibration as much as possible. Find these people and environments before starting to take a new action in your own life. Very interesting. So the opposite of that is to be around people that are different than you, to be in circumstances that are different than you. And what I like about this report is it's telling me, okay, I lean left or I lean right. Okay, great. For me, it's likeness. And it actually shows you where on the chart you are. So if you look, let me see if I can pull this up. So this is contrast. This is unlike. And this is similarity and where I am on the spectrum, the, I think she said the blue, the red X indicates how you are currently acting and the blue X indicates how you are designed. So I'm supposed to be on the blue and I'm actually on the red. So I'm still a little bit too much around unlikeness. So it's telling me whether or not I'm in alignment with that energy. So. I'm not supposed to be completely with people similar and circumstances that are similar, but I'm supposed to be far off in that spectrum and I'm pretty close. So I'm very close. Um, some of the questions you can ask yourself is what gifts do you recognize in others? How is what you want the same as what you've created before? Who or what upholds the same vibration of what you desire? So just consider these things. When you manifest, it's different for people, okay? We're not all the same. 
And these are some questions that you can ask. So the next one is, do you experience more of your divinity through the choice or the consequence? In other words, are you designed to be aligned to the process of what you are doing or the outcome that brings action? So this is also an interesting one because it's saying, are you focusing on the vision, the goal, or getting there? Or are you focusing on the individual choices that make you get there? So for me, I am designed to experience myself through the outcome or the consequence of my choices rather than the process to get there. The outcome that you desire will be what dictates the process to get there. You must always manifest with the end goal in mind and you need a specific and clear vision of what it is that you're trying to create. It is the outcome that needs to be aligned to who you are. And once that is defined, then you need to set about planning your actions around that outcome to achieve and not the other way around. So I'm motivated and I manifest best when I focus on, I'm going to New York, not should I take a helicopter? Should I fly? Should I swim? Should I take a plane? Should I take a train? Should I run, walk, hitchhike, dig a hole, find a tunnel? <laughs> you know? So the process of getting there is not what I'm supposed to focus on. The individual choice, that doesn't matter. For me, it's the end result. My question for you is how do you manifest best? And are you acting in alignment with that? Some people focus too much on the process. You're just supposed to focus on the goal. Okay, next question. Do you use yourself as a reference point for comparing and contrasting or do you use others? In other words, is the relationship you have with yourself or others of most importance in understanding yourself. Okay, so how am I going to understand myself? Do I use it? Do I understand myself the best when I'm talking to and engaging with and, and, and understanding other people? Or is it when I use myself as a reference point? For me, it's myself. You use yourself as a reference point for comparing and contrasting. Your relationship with yourself is the relationship that informs you the most. External relationships don't offer as much of an experience of understanding who you are and what you want as your internal relationship with yourself does. And therefore, you really don't need as much interaction with others as most people do. There's, a gr there's just not a great deal of information about your own nature to be found in others. In fact, too much interaction with others can actually cloud your inner experience with yourself and create confusion and exhaustion. Interesting, right? You are designed, let's see, uh, as a service provider, you'll experience yourself more because you are, you are witness to your own brilliance and gifts rather than how much you can help others. How you treat yourself and the perceptions that you have of yourself will be directly reflected in how others treat you. You are designed to compare and contrast to your inner world, but be careful that you don't get too lost in your own head contemplating your own experience. I mean, there's more here. I'm not going to read all of it. It's not a website. This was a reading that I did with my friend. Um, so which one are you? Do you, do you understand yourself better from your inner experience or from your outer experience? You might be acting as one. Doesn't mean it is the one that's best for you. And now these are all questions relating to how you manifest best. And you might be manifesting out of alignment. Think of like you have a manifestation potential. If, if I were to, in this case, be around similar people, focus on the vision and the outcome and focus on my inner world experience when understanding myself, I will increase my manifestation potential so that I can manifest best. Okay, I'm gonna do a couple more. We're out of time here, but let's, let me do one more. 
and it's starting to rain on me. Um, last one that just because we talked about it was, do you manifest based on what you want or what you don't want? Ooh, I'm about to get rain poured on. One sec, guys. <laughs> Actually, let's go here. Technology and water is never a good thing. Okay. So, my computer got a nice rinse. Um, do you create intentions and manifest based on what you want or what you don't want? Are you acting to include new vibrational states into your experience? or exclude states you don't want from your experience. So in this case, I'm designed to create intentions based on what I want, not what I don't want. It's all about finding new vibrational states that you wanna incorporate into your experience. You will put yourself in new situations and environments to see if you do want to integrate these vibrations into your being. You have a tendency to always want to add something into your life but watch out that this doesn't make you unwilling to let go of what has already served you you will always want to include more and not wanting to act in the energy of exclusion especially with other people think about thinking about what you don't want is actually very counterproductive activity for you you need to focus on what you do want to create as a new outcome so Again, everybody's different. Some people will manifest best when, when they're actually focusing on what they don't want. For me, it's what I do want. And I just wanted to bring that up today that I've realized there is right and wrong in certain people's experience. For me, it's not about right or wrong. It's just about the experience. And it's not about the individual choice, it's about the outcome. So I just wanted to bring that up. Those are only four of the seven questions. Maybe next time I'll talk about the rest on Tuesday in my next live. Um, if you're in our circle community, we've added location-based spaces so you can join your city or country. We're gonna be adding the astrology charts. So if you wanna be with Aquarians, you can join the Aquarian group. If you want to be with the Sagittariuses, you can join the Sagittarius group so that we can start to bring people together among similarities. So that's coming soon. I'm going to work on that today. And uh, yeah, super excited to see everybody's transformation. I'm overwhelmingly grateful and appreciative and excited to see everybody going through their 28 day life reset right now. It's been, it's been wonderful to see everybody's comments it warms my heart to see people connecting from different countries messaging each other and getting together and working together and helping each other through the program and that's how i see community communities when we get together and help each other so thank you all for being here for supporting and i hope to see you in the 28 day life reset take care